Good afternoon. My name is Liz Plater Zyberg. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Miami, and um, it gives me great pleasure to moderate um, uh, yet another research panel at CNU. Um, the goal for this session, and um, we had one yesterday that Dr. Chuck Bowl moderated, um, is to bring um, research projects to the CNU, but also to give researchers and faculty the opportunity for peer review, um, which is important to their career path in the university. Um, some of you may have been uh, in the room next door uh, immediately prior to this where Dr. Larry Frank talked about the research that um, he's been carrying on for a long career, which has indeed influenced policy um, and the whole discussion about um, obesity in the built environment, health in the built environment. And so um, I think we all understand the value um, of developing um, peer-reviewed research capacity um, uh, in across the disciplines um, which are related to the new urbanism. So. Uh, this afternoon, we have three presentations. Um, uh, Jaime Correa, who uh, also faculty at the University of Miami, who um, managed the um, research sessions this year, made the suggestion that um, uh, a topic be addressed um, to focus the work, and that was uh, indeed tactical urbanism. And so we will begin with a presentation on um, transportation impacts and value of a certain kind of tactical urbanism, the parklet. Um, secondly, going on to how the Denver bike sharing system originated um, in tactical urbanism uh, efforts. And finally, um, pulling out uh, a little bit to a bigger picture um, uh, with an examination of how um, tactical urbanism could be assisted by um, the toolkits of pattern language. Uh, so I have asked each in each uh, speaker to introduce themselves briefly just to help us move along. And um, the presentations will be about 10 minutes, and that should give us enough time to have a discussion afterwards. So sure. from Thank parking you. to park. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Dye. Um, I'm a current master's student at UC Berkeley studying city planning and transportation engineering. Um, my background before that um, is public policy and community development. Thanks. My name is Andy Duvall. I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, my background is in uh, anthropology and looking at how people um, interact with spaces. My uh, uh, doctorate is in health and behavioral sciences, and I was uh, an IGERT uh, National Science Foundation uh, funded student. Um, I'm uh, Michael Mahaffey. I'm the executive director of the Stasis Foundation. I see one of our board members, Bernie Franceschi, here, uh, and I'm also a uh, doing doctoral work in uh, related uh, topics at Delft uh, University of Technology. Thanks. Great, thanks. So I guess I'll start. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out here on a very sunny Saturday afternoon. Um, I really appreciate you guys all making out here. Um, and so today I'll be presenting about my research on parklets, um, so this really cool emerging urban innovation. Um, and as a quick overview, um, I know that you know this is the last day of CNU. You guys have taken a lot of information in, and one thing that I've learned from my professors is always to point out three important things that you can take away. Um, so by the end of this presentation, I hope that um, you guys have another layer of understanding of what parklets are, how diverse they are, um, some of their full impacts, especially on transportation, so thinking in terms of pedestrian traffic, um, vehicular traffic, et cetera, and also the value that they add um, and ways to measure that value. So um, I compared parklets to parking space, and also I'll be talking about an analytic hierarchy, hierarchy process. Um, so first, just to set the framework and make sure we're all on the same page, you know, what are, what are parklets and how do they emerge? Um, 
And I think that Don Shoup's um, High Cost of Free Parking, for those of you who haven't read it, it's really great. Um, it really um, gets to this, that subsidies mask the true cost of parking, that there's an oversupply that creates a lot of negative externalities, increases energy consumption. There are, what we take for granted, this free parking is, is not actually quite free. And that also, there's a real desire to bring nature back into cities. So you can see here, there's a pretty, pretty exciting looking street, right? <laughs> So in 2005, um, San Francisco art and design firm Rebar Group, um, they installed a temporary park um, just for two hours in downtown San Francisco. So if you see here, that was the image before, and this is what they did, which is pretty awesome. See, it's complete with a lawn, um, shade tree, and park bench. Um, sparked parking day movement. You can see here there's a lot of cool parklets um, converting curbside parallel parking spaces into these public spheres. And what's pretty cool about that was, um, so Rebar Group, that was, um, that was in 2005, and um, San Francisco's planning department started a pavement to parks program, which seeks to identify these underutilized spaces and then turn them into public spaces. So not just for, not just parklets, but also um, plazas, et cetera. So here's the San Jose Guerrero Park. Pretty beautiful. And um, the success of Parking Day and the rise of tactical urbanism, especially in the last 10 years, um, has really encouraged more experiments. And um, I wanted to draw attention to this manual that was put out um, earlier in earlier this year. I think it's really great. If you haven't seen it, it's a great resource that tells you a lot about the design considerations and how would you go about actually starting a parklet. So that was um, the background on the diversity of parklets. And um, for me, uh, I just moved to the Bay Area and seeing these really fascinating um, Looking at the literature, it focuses almost exclusively um, about parklets as a placemaking tool. And I'm a, I'm a student of transportation. Um, I'm studying transportation engineering and city planning, and I come in with that lens. Um, so I think to myself, you know, more information is needed, especially um, when you're talking about something as sensitive as parking. Um, people view parking as free, you know, like, don't touch my parking. Um, so. You can imagine that if you have a critical mass or like a critical number of parklets, how would that actually affect um, pedestrian traffic, vehicular traffic, and um, thinking in terms like what value um, do parklets add? So I come in with a lot of different questions that I'm trying to answer. Um, and so I did as what a lot of um, scholars do, which is to conduct a case study. Um, so I looked at San Francisco. Here's um, a map of, um, from the planning department of all their tactical urbanism projects, and what's in green are the highlighted parklets. Um, and I looked specifically at, um, does this work? Yeah. Here. Um, so I looked at the Mission neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, for those of you who are from the Bay Area, it's, yes, it's a very hipster area, but I chose that um, in particular because of the high concentration of parklets and also because of the availability of parking data, which I'll get to um, after. So I looked specifically at this one block that has three parklets on it. Identified here, Valencia Street, so Dolores Park. Um, so this, this parklet um, is hosted by a bike shop, and it has a bike corral and also some seating. Um, this is the Deepest Stand National Parklet. It has an official Facebook page and everything. It's pretty great. Or it's also known as the Deeplet. Um, it's hosted by a San Francisco resident. Um, and then this is hosted by Blue Fig, a coffee shop, um, and it has um, tables and seats. And so in thinking about um, how you would evaluate pedestrian um, traffic, uh, doing a very qualitative observation, there's the San Francisco Great Streets Project. 
um, they had a bunch of pedestrian counts, pedestrian surveys to do like a before and after, before you construct a parklet and afterwards, seeing how people engage with it, right? Do people, um, are they sitting there? Are they just passing through? What what are they doing? Um, so following the same model, um, I observed the three parklets on the, on that block um, and saw um, on an afternoon and an evening and just made lots of observations in the vein of like William um, Wyatt and um, Kevin Lynch and what I found was that you know parklets are extremely diverse as you've seen and not all are created equal so going back here um, the one hosted by the um, coffee shop saw the most activity. You know, they had seating and tables, and it's interesting to note that even though it's hosted by a coffee shop, I saw um, other people coming from other blocks with like different coffees. So it's it's still a fairly public sphere. Um, but the parklet that's a green space, so the deep lit, I didn't see that many people stopping or using it. So um, just just need to point out um, in terms of that the design aesthetics affect um, pedestrian traffic. Um, and in looking at vehicular impacts, so analysis of the parking activity, um, I used SF Park data. So SF Park is a pilot program that started a couple years ago in San Francisco. It's a on-demand um, parking management system. So it dynamically prices parking spaces um, according to like how many people they expect to use it with the goal of achieving 85% occupancy rate. Um, and so using that data, I was comparing um, this nine hundred block on Valencia Street with other blocks on Valencia Street that didn't have parklets and seeing if there were um, any trends you can notice because you might expect that the blocks with um, parklets have different occupancy rates. So here um, just using the SF Park occupancy data um, so there's the 900 block and there's another block on Valencia Street that also has parklets and then the blocks without also Valencia Street that there aren't that many trends you can see right here um, initially. So um, from this, it suggests that at this point in time, by just taking away a few parking spaces, that parklets um, do not have a significant impact on parking activity. But who knows what might happen um, in the future. Um, so I talked a bit about thinking um, about the transportation impacts in terms of pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic and like circling and parking spillover. Um, but so what is the value of a park light compared to a parking space? Um, so using a lot of different reports um, came up with generally a price for what that parking space would be in um, in the mission. So the city is foregoing um, like, you know, parking meter revenue, revenue from citations, yet they're also gaining um, operations and maintenance and different environmental and indirect costs, right? Um, so the net benefit for just one parking space, I calculated that to be nearly $5,000. Um, and so if you multiply that by two parking spaces, which is what a parklet typically takes up, it's nearly $10,000. Um, and a typical parklet application, that's how much the city gets. So from this analysis, it suggests that the city is willing to forego um, $7,500 annually in favor of a parklet. So from here, it makes me think that, well, um, what are the social and environmental benefits that um, that can make that up to? And like, the, what, what is the additional value of parklet? Um, and I think that the um, process called the analytic hierarchy process approach um, is one frame. Um, it's an alternative to traditional cost-benefit analysis. Um, I don't know about any of you, but if you try to quantify a lot of like social environmental benefits, GHG reductions, it's extremely difficult to quantify. And um, I'm offering this as an alternative or as a new tool to a, a new metric and, a, and a, another way that you can think about it um, for a hypothetical parklet model for any type of uh, major decisions that you make. 
So the way that it works, I'll explain through um, example. Um, so, so excuse me for all you designers out here, a bunch of tables now. Um, so here, um, it's a decision-making tool, so having um, different alternatives. So before I identified that um, parklets are really diverse, it could be for like a green space or with seating or as a gathering space. Um, and then so thinking about um, your different decisions I have to make and the different factors that might follow through it and then having different weighted scores. Um, and then calculating or like ranking them in terms of what you think would be for each alternative. So for example, for traffic calming and increasing increases safety, um, by having by not having a parklet, that's a really like terrible benefit. So it gets a one, and then it's fairly important here. And so you can create a composite um, benefit score. And you, um, similarly, doing that with um, with the costs here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so so just to wrap up. Um, so comparing, you can create um, using the analytic hierarchy process a ranking tool, so benefits and costs. Um, and in thinking about it, not building a parklet, it's still pretty costly, but again, not all parklets are created equal, so design considerations are important. So with um, parklets with seating and tables might have more value than, say, a parklet that um, just has some green space. Um, so before, when I started off the presentation, I wanted to stress like the diversity, the impacts, and the value of parklets. And I hope that I provided some insight um, just to think about parklets more than just a placemaking tool. Think of it in terms of the potential transportation impacts that it has. Um, and also uh, another way to quantify the value of parklets. And thank you very much. All right, thanks. Um, uh, again, my name's Andy Duvall. I'm uh, here to share the story about how Denver got a bike sharing system. So very quickly, a show of hands, uh, how many people know what public bike sharing is? Almost everybody, great. Uh, if you get a chance, you should definitely check out the uh, green bike system here in, in Salt Lake City while you're here. Um, so first off, is one of, Denver's one of the, the, the most car-dependent cities historically in the U.S. Um, so how did it end up with one of the first bike-sharing systems in, in the country? And then how did this, this process end up uh, having a, a, a real effect that started to uh, increase and, and modify uh, the, the bike the share of bicycle mode share um, uh, throughout the city. Uh, starting in 2007, uh, well, Denver was chosen as the site for the 2008 uh, Democratic National Convention. And at the time, Mayor Hickenlooper uh, declared that it would be the greenest in the history of mankind. He's uh, a kind of flamboyant character, uh, likes to make a pretty bold statement He's now the governor of Colorado, but at the time, um, that threw a lot of gears in motion to, uh, to, to try to define what that means and to, to uh, understand and put into practice what a sustainable large event might look like. Uh, so one of the components uh, of, of this challenge uh, was taken up by bicycle advocates in the city and the area. Uh, they were very loosely affiliated at that time and not very professional, and this process helped change that quite a bit. Uh, the initial idea uh, 
uh, came about through uh, the, the, at the time, recent opening of the Paris Velib bike sharing system. Uh, it opened during the summer of 2007. Uh, at the time in Denver, I was probably one of the few people who was aware of what public bike sharing was. And through some chance uh, contacts, I came into uh, to, uh, contact with some people in the Denver mayor's office who had an interest and in, uh, maybe putting in place a temporary bike sharing system for the, for the DNC and wanted to know if it was practical. So uh, that was in late 2007. The Democratic National Convention was in August of 2008. So the time period um, to make this happen was fairly quick. Uh, through connections uh, and, and local community leaders and business leaders, as well as through the advocacy community and various other community groups, uh, a, a group with the task of bringing a, uh, a temporary bike sharing system uh, into action uh, sprang up and, and immediately began work. Uh, one of the connections was with Bikes Belong, which is a national uh, bike advocacy organization based in Boulder. They were able to source uh, bikes from manufacturers, brand new bikes uh, that were donated for temporary use for the system. They came like this. Uh, they ultimately were able to provide a thousand bikes that were located at six automated stations. Now the bikes came dealer ready, which means uh, that they required a fair amount of assembly and a lot of room to house the bikes. And so uh, through community efforts, uh, a warehouse was located, uh, the use of which was donated by local business uh, owner, and a wide variety of different types of volunteers came together to assemble the bikes, uh, to uh, choose station sites, and uh, this whole process really started to pull the community together. Ultimately, this is, uh, this is what happened. This is uh, the, the freewheeling uh, public bike sharing system. Uh, this is an example of one station located in central downtown. This was just prior to the, uh, the uh, convention taking off, and so it's not quite as fully populated. Uh, but during the convention, uh, the six stations that were spread around in downtown uh, were, were very popular and immediately it was perceived that this would be something great to have in the long term. And so the, uh, the group of advocates and, and organizers that came together decided uh, that this, this was something worth seizing and so um, really pushed for a permanent system. Here's another shot of uh, the bikes at the DNC at one of the stations. Uh, a lot of bikes. Once the, once the system had, uh, had been in operation, uh, actually prior to, to the system being in operation, it started gaining momentum toward a permanent uh, long-term public bike sharing system. There wasn't an example existing in the U.S. at the time, and so a lot of it had to be invented at the, the ground level. And many of the people involved uh, helped develop what bike sharing is in, in currently in the U.S., including um, the vendor that supplies the bikes uh, uh, that are here in Salt Lake City, as well as many other places. Uh, one of the key initial uh, parts of, of bringing this to success was garnering political buy-in. Uh, Mayor Hickenlooper uh, became interested in the project and uh, consequently it was decided to uh, make a similar temporary system for Minneapolis for the Republican National Convention in 2008. And so there, there started to be a bit of a friendly competition between the mayors of the two cities. Uh, Along with this, prior to the DNC itself, uh, the, the, the groundswell of interest among the bike community um, led to uh, a planning charrette trying to envision what bikes meant uh, would mean to Denver in the future. Uh, 
Here are the two mayors and, and members of their staff riding during the DNC. Um, here's the, the, the final night of the, the convention at, uh, at the time in Vesco Field when uh, then candidate Obama spoke. Uh, 1,500 bikes showed up from, from the, the, the population, privately owned bikes, as well as nearly half of the bikes that were in the temporary fleet. Uh, prior to the DNC as well, uh, there, there was a, a huge project to try to improve the street infrastructure, including some of the first applications of uh, Sharrows in Denver. Here's a, an example of, of, this is the street network. The red are bicycle facilities, on-street bicycle facilities. Um, also, during the DNC, it became apparent that measurement uh, was going to be very important. And so um, each bike was equipped with a, a way to measure its use. There ended up being 5,500 plus rides and about 26,000 miles over the course of three days. How many miles? Uh, 26,000. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, a, a shot of, of some of the people that were commuting in and out of downtown. Uh, this, this project really started to build speed in the bicycle, um, bicycling community in Denver. It really solicited a lot of community involvement and provided helpful pressure from the outside for change in government uh, agencies and, and policies. Uh, Bicycle facilities became desired and, and even demanded in various neighborhoods without, throughout the city. And uh, people really started taking advantages of opportunities to improve and increase bike use. Expanding uh, political capital is something that uh, uh, is not part of the infrastructural developments, but part of building the culture of bicycling in the city. And there's an emergence of a bicycling constituency. Uh, with the launch of the, the, uh, the permanent B-cycle system, it depended a lot on volunteers and community members, hundreds of which volunteered to help uh, with the bikes. It also led to expansion of the, profession, the professionalization of the, the local bike advocacy community. This is a, a, a a bike parking facility that's temporarily set up for large events. Uh, bike Denver, the local bike advocacy group, uh, provides bike parking, uh, secure bike parking for dozens of events uh, throughout the year. Uh, in 2008, uh, this bar here, that's uh, when the, the DNC occurred. And since then, there's been growth and the bicycle commuter mode share as measured by the uh, U.S. Census American Community Survey. It's a, not a perfect measure, but it's the best thing that there is available currently. Uh, it's not a direct correlation with uh, the, the advent of the, uh, the Denver B-Cycle permanent bike sharing system, which happened in 2010, but it shows a groundswell of interest and support for bicycling activity. Uh, here's Mayor, current Mayor Hancock. Um, talking at Bike to Work Day. So very quickly, um, the tactical urbanism components um, involved with this project. I wasn't familiar with the term tactical urbanism at the time. Uh, no one involved with the project was. But it fits many of, of the, the, the five items associated with tactical urbanism. Uh, it's a deliberate approach to an instigating change that has uh, come about and, and become supported throughout the community. It's actually had a wider, uh, wider impact than anyone I think originally would have envisioned. Uh, there are now more than two dozen bike sharing systems in the U.S. There are about 500 worldwide. Uh, Denver's bike sharing system that developed uh, through the DNC experience has helped to inform a lot of the cities. Uh, that have since uh, adopted bike sharing. Uh, and and the, the realization of this uh, really came into play after the, the DNC uh, project was a success. People saw it and, and experienced it and realized that it could be something positive for their neighborhoods and their city. 
um, and working toward the future. All right. Thank you. Thanks. should do it. Yeah, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I'd like to do is describe for you some research that um, uh, we've been doing. I mentioned earlier the Stasis Foundation and our colleague, uh, Bernie Franceschi, there, um, as well as uh, some other work uh, at universities, Arizona State, uh, and uh, other institutions um, on using pattern languages as a specific tool and a specific way forward in tactical urbanism, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I think the growing interest in tactical urbanism reflects uh, also a growing awareness that we're going to have to make urban changes more catalytically, uh, as the Mike Leiden list uh, suggested, especially in an age of more limited resources. Uh, we're going to have to do more with less. Uh, and for a number of interesting reasons, uh, that's actually uh, a pretty positive opportunity. So, uh, I'll discuss those reasons in a minute. Uh, but I'll argue that to do that, we need effective tools that can work together uh, in a kind of coordinated toolkit form. Um, and the tools have to be able to evolve and adapt to target specific requirements and barriers. Um, so I completely agree we need to see implementation of these, and we're working on that in some uh, projects projects uh, as well that I'll mention. Uh, but first, what I'll do is describe an example uh, of, of an approach aimed at meeting these requirements uh, using an expanded system of pattern languages uh, that we've been developing uh, in this research. And as many of you probably know, pattern languages have uh, been quite effective in software design and in other uh, fields, although they've been neglected uh, in, for interesting reasons in the fields of urban planning and building design. Uh, but as I'd like to explore with you uh, now, I think this presents an intriguing opportunity for those of us in the built environment to learn from these folks and the uh, fabulous successes they've had uh, and apply those lessons to uh, tactical urbanism in particular. Um, I'll start by noting that all of the related emerging concepts and approaches of tactical urbanism and urban acupuncture, peer-to-peer -peer urbanism, economic gardening, and so on, uh, follow the insight that was probably first discussed uh, most thoroughly by Jane Jacobs, uh, that urban planning and design are not linear sequential engineering processes. They require an understanding and, ex and an exploitation of the dynamics of self-organization. Uh, an understanding, as Jacobs put it, of the kind of problem a city is. Uh, that problem is fundamentally one of managing a network of factors, not just one or two silver bullets. Uh, and so this requires a different way of thinking, uh, what Jacobs famously called a web way of thinking, um, and a different way of acting. Uh, we can't treat the city as a tree, as a kind of simple hierarchy from working from the top down, as Christopher Alexander uh, also pointed out in his landmark paper by that name. We have to see the city as a semi-lattice, as a, a mix or uh, interacting factors that are uh, producing the outcomes that we see, whether those are good or bad outcomes. Uh, and these outcomes are generated through a complex interaction of incentives and disincentives, what we might think of as the kind of operating system uh, that governs the kinds of design and construction activities that can take place, and especially how much a certain kind of development activity costs uh, in relation to how much it's rewarded, whether it pencils and so on. And this operating system includes all the laws, the rules, fees, standards, and all the parameters that drive us all crazy in our work. Uh, but that ultimately do govern what can be done and where, and for what cost and reward, uh, both financial rewards uh, and other kinds of rewards. 
So we have to go after this complex network of barriers, the disincentives to good development and the hidden incentives for bad development, uh, like the so-called externalities uh, that are subsidized by taxpayers in the future, uh, and really by all of us in the future. Um, so um, a, a couple of the concerted steps that uh, I think we have to take to target these barriers uh, through a kind of a, a acupuncture strategy, if you will, uh, were identified by my students uh, when, in a research project at Arizona State. Uh, increased certainty in the entitlement process. Uncertainty equals risk equals cost. Uh, lower the relative cost of higher density projects by easing the, the regulatory requirements like parking, uh, work to reduce cost, streamline regulations for mixed use and infill development by coordinating what are often conflicting requirements, uh, work to overcome fragmented land ownership patterns by partnering with entities that can, can work in a more coordinated uh, way and assemble opportunity sites and so on, lead the playing field relative to suburban edge development, uh, excuse me, level the playing field uh, relative to suburban edge development by eliminating the often hidden subsidies uh, for uh, suburban edge development and requiring all development to pay its true cost to taxpayers and citizens, something that everybody can get behind, I think Tea Party and, and others. Examine fees and other pricing signals, uh, SDC uh, costs and, and other things. Uh, overcome the chicken and egg problem of weak markets by identifying uh, strategic problems and going after those uh, tactically with things like farmers markets. Uh, compensate for lack of capital for larger, more conventional development projects by incentivizing smaller pay-as-you-go development uh, and preparing sites for incremental development. Again, this is where we really get into tactical urbanism. Um, so the approach here is to, to uh, go after all of those goals with specific tools and toolkits. They're out there. We all know many of these local improvement districts uh, uh, tax increment finance and so on, but they need to be made easy to use, simple, uh, regulations need to be streamlined, these things need to be made to work in a kind of plug and play approach. And the pattern language strategy is, lends itself very much to that. For example, taking the place, uh, as many of you may know, the place types system used for transit oriented developments, if you take that as a kind of place pattern system and have sub patterns that are all uh, able to be uh, used in different sites and customized to those local sites. Um, so uh, what's really behind all this is um, what's going on in the software community. Um, I'll go back just a moment and, and note that all of these issues are interrelated. We can't just do one or two. We have to take concerted action, so we have to have a coordinated approach. Um, uh, so at Cystasis, uh, we've been working with uh, a number of uh, really interesting people, including this fellow on the left here, uh, the remarkable inventor of Wiki, uh, Ward Cunningham, uh, who is also a pioneer of agile development, if you remember that term. Uh, and there's a, a real important lesson for us. Agile is a kind of tactical approach that cuts through the complexity, uh, but that uses a network of tools and approaches that are plug and play in just this way. Uh, and Ward is also a pioneer of pattern languages, uh, and there is an important connection there. Pattern languages also provide this capacity to manage networks of factors and to achieve simpler and more elegant outcomes. And that's why they've developed such uh, usefulness, such power really, in software uh, and led directly to such uh, useful inventions as Wiki uh, and other tools. So patterns and pattern languages provide an essential capability that's not easy to achieve with a more linear technology. The ability to create these functional networks uh, in both structure and in process in a, in a very simplified, coordinated way. Uh, so in the case of urban systems, we're also dealing with interconnected spatial networks, networks of, of place. And I want to talk just for a moment about that because it's an important difference from the software. Uh, this interconnected network pattern stretches across kinds of structure as well as scales of structure. For example, uh, street networks, uh, pedestrian paths, small and room-like uh, urban spaces, uh, even uh, building details all manifest uh, this kind of network structure where the user can control and modulate the, uh, the uh, membranes, if you will, between these different uh, structural elements. Uh, 
And likewise, the processes that people undergo to structure spaces over time and the tools that they, that they use also manifest the characteristics of networks. Uh, all of these structures extend across a wide range of, of scales uh, and across a wide range uh, of, of scales of, of space as well as time. Here's this, this street in London that I showed you before. And what's interesting is uh, you'll see over eight years uh, the two shots were taken. Uh, there have been many more changes where the users themselves have come in and mutated, made small changes to the balconies and to their private spaces and to uh, railings and hedges and entryways and so on. So I think the job of us as tactical urbanists is not so much to make these mutations for the users uh, as to actually empower the users to make these kinds of mutations themselves as the kinds of agents uh, that are making the city, the autocatalytic, the self-organizing agents. In this way, the tactical urbanist is not specifying urban growth, uh, which is always going to be inherently limited as an approach, but is generating growth uh, on a possibly much larger and certainly more uh, complex scale uh, by providing the DNA, if you will, uh, that can generate this structure. Uh, so as I close, I want to show you just a few slides uh, of uh, some of the tools that we're developing. And I mentioned we're working uh, on a few projects, including a DPZ project in eastern Washington, where we're using pattern languages uh, and, and using that as part of the charrette process. Very interesting results we're getting there. Uh, again, this is a spatial network. This is a, just to show you an example. Here's uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, here's Italy. Again, these are spatial networks that the users are mutating and making changes over time. And I would argue that that's what's happening in the greatest cities that we know all over the world. And that's what's not happening in our uh, failing modern uh, segregated uh, uh, zoning. So we're doing paper uh, pattern languages. This is one that my students did at Arizona State, farmer's market, town center pattern, really uh, good, good sensible stuff. Uh, other kinds of pattern languages based upon the computer uh, that give people the ability to work with uh, the language as a kind of a wiki, a community design wiki. This is what we did in New Orleans when we were working on uh, these concepts, uh, giving them pre-approved plans and readiness diagnostics, ways to really simplify and understand and make this very intimidating process user-friendly so the homeowners and the business owners themselves could start uh, repairing and rebuilding their homes. Uh, just to mention, uh, uh, talking about bicycles, uh, uh, we looked at, the, with the city of Portland, a bicycle pattern language system, also a biphilia pattern language system, which is taking some of the insights from uh, healthcare design, applying those to urban systems on a broad scale uh, and again with the the many parks and all the other things that we um, uh, are have been talking about today uh, what's also interesting is Ward has uh, integrated the capability to handle data with patterns so that the patterns can exchange data between each other and use that as very rapid and efficient uh, scenario modeling very simple and easy to use this is work he did for Nike doing their sustainability metrics so I'm working now on uh, an urban sustainability uh, thing looking specifically at carbon, but it could also be looking at other uh, uh, issues. For example, if you could give people handhelds and have them go out and do measurements of their own community and, and do this kind of crowdsourcing uh, measurement work. Uh, you can, uh, there's a number of other uh, kinds of tools that uh, are very exciting, we think, uh, in terms of the capability of computers, uh, particularly when they're distributed and they empower people to be these kind of catalytic uh, tactical urbanists. Uh, so again, we think this is very exciting work and we'd love to talk to uh, those of you who are interested in, in uh, perhaps uh, collaborating with us. Thank you. So I'd like to not delay very much in bringing us to uh, questions from the audience, but I think the first question might be, how do we bring these diverse presentations together um, for a discussion? Uh, so uh, I found it kind of interesting that the first two really were about um, individual efforts, from the very smallest effort that a cafe owner might be able to do in front of their, um, a cafe operator in front of their business to uh, something that requires a little bit more coordination um, and, in fact, spoke of a, a, a process of people coming together to decide to do the bicycle system, too. 
uh, an approach that's really a kind of societal um, uh, tactic um, uh, of how to get, how to enable, you use the word, to, um, for people to be able to make changes quickly. I think the one shared goal, of course, here is, just as it is in the CNU, positive, um, to be a positive change agent in the city. And um, the, I think the two examples that we saw were um, remarkable for the speed with which, and of course that's an aspect of um, tactical urbanism, with which some um, action or goal could be implemented. Um, uh, both projects, the parklets and the bicycles being less than a decade, and probably even less than that, but from the time of inception and thinking about it and being able to look back on um, uh, the achievement. Um, and so doing something in less than a decade is really an achievement in the city, I think. Um, so um, what you saw in these presentations was really very clear and concise PowerPoints. Um, the papers are more thorough. Um, and uh, if you're interested in them, you might find them, I think, on the CMU website, if not now, soon. Um, but I'd like to start with a question for Andrew, and then maybe we'll go to the, you all can be thinking about your questions. You used two phrases in the paper, which I didn't hear uh, in the presentation, but I found intriguing because you spoke of um, the, um, the fact that tactical urbanism offers um, an opportunity for you did mention collaborative um, uh, work, but you use the terms iterative thinking and knowledge controversies. Um, and so since there are always um, opposing opinions about anything and great fear of trying something new, I'm presuming you um, were referring to that in terms of knowledge controversies, but could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, sure. Uh, I think uh uh, iterative, iterative thinking um, really was very applied in the, the instance of the, the DNC temporary bike sharing system. Uh, it was inventing it on the ground as it was happening. Um, and so that, the controversies arose through differing perspectives of how it should be done. Um, and encountering uh, uh, people who said, no, it can't happen. and insisting that it can. And it's really just a matter of learning how to negotiate uh, and, and to be inclusive uh, among a variety of different groups that may ultimately have the same goal, but different ways to get there. Um, one thing that we found was there isn't always one right answer. And sometimes taking those multiple correct answers uh, and applying them um, in specific cases, I'm, I'm thinking specifically uh, regarding siting stations, deciding where they should go, um, getting permits and, and uh, land use agreements associated with them. That process is incredibly complex. And uh, without differing opinions that sometimes clashed, it wouldn't have been possible. Questions from the floor? Really? 
So you're bringing up the point that it's a it's a way of experimenting, which planning has never been able to afford. Thank you. I think I should ask everybody to identify themselves. We like to well, get to I'm know Richard each other. Lane yes. Lane Pardon me? I'm Richard from Washington. From, from Washington. Right um, thank um, you. Liz? Yes. Uh, just to uh, uh, comment on that, thanks. I, I, uh, I agree, as you, you know, because um, we've talked about this before. But um, the, uh, there is one thing about, um, just to note about the pattern language approach, which is that uh, the patterns are not um, uh, designs in the abstract that are brought down. You know, they really are sort of little experiments that, uh, and particularly the, when you have a project pattern language, the whole thing is kind of an experiment. And out of that might emerge a whole new pattern. So it is very much a sort of on the ground tactical kind of process that um, is supposed to generate these things. In fact, that's one of the problems is that hasn't happened enough in, in the architecture world. In software, people are brilliant at doing this, but we've, we've been lagging behind. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Please tell us who you are. Well, you know, I think that's one of the advantages of these um, of the tactic um, is that it can be short term and enable some of the controversy to be dissipated in some cases, let's say between the planner and the traffic engineer by saying it's not a forever change. It doesn't cost a lot. Let's try it out and then let's observe um, what the results are. And I, uh, one of the things um, Danielle's uh, paper, which um, looked at the parklets in terms of observation. I found myself um, upon first reading saying, well, um, these are your observations. Uh, uh, someone else might ask for scientific counts for you to sit there several days in a row and really count how many people used it in certain ways. Um, and uh, then some other way of counting the effect on the parking. But in fact, I think probably um, depending on observation in a, in a situation like this, could be adequate in, for that controversy. I don't know, that's a, that's a question that, that I have. Yes, Wanda.
So you might use a parking space in front of a bus stop to make the waiting for the bus a more amenable experience. So um, you mentioned the San Francisco manual. Does that, is that a help? Um, so at this point in time, it's my understanding that um, a lot of the parklets, um, they're started by business owners um, and then some residents. So I highlighted um, the deep lead, the deepest stand national parkland. That was a very enthusiastic resident who wanted um, his own parklet, um, well, a, sh a shared parklet. Um, but what I, I really like your comment from before and just to stress to everybody else that you know right now we're in the CNU community and we talk in terms of tactical urbanism and parklet but um, when I'm talking amongst my friends and you know I say like oh I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about parklets and then some people are like what are what are parklets you know outside of um, city planning or transportation engineering and then just telling them about this idea just to um, continue to spread um, what these figuring out other languages to use besides just like um, tactical urbanism. You know, if, if you say like, oh, you know, think about this parking space, wouldn't it be cool to just have a park there? Well, there's a thing called parklets, like introducing that. Um, and then to your point about, um, uh, about whether or not people know about it. Um, so in San Francisco, they're required to put a, a fairly large sign that says public parklet um, and there's like two or three like in like at each parklet you'll see it so unless you have to read the sign to see it but um, the more and more you engage then the more you know so question here and then we'll move across the aisle yes Sure. Uh, yeah, definitely weather is a factor, um, but maybe not in the way that you might think. Uh, currently, the Denver bike sharing system stays open uh, from mid-March to the beginning of December. And uh, the perception of Denver is that it's fairly snowy, but in reality, we have a lot of days throughout the winter that are in the 60s and 70s, uh, completely free of snow. and people are constantly asking why the bikes aren't available. I think there is a strong demand uh, to have the system stay open year round. Uh, ridership does drop, but I have found that it's more associated with uh, the change in daylight savings than it is weather. Uh, when uh, daylight savings time uh, ends and standard time begins, there's a, a noticeable drop off each year uh, in the number of riders, and that's backed up by conversations that I have with people who use the system who are less uh, interested in riding a bike at night uh, am among cars. So um, weather is certainly a factor, um, but there, there probably isn't enough yet known about it as to whether or not um, it would dramatically affect um, operations if it were to remain open year round. Most of the other large uh, bike sharing systems in the U.S. do close down at some portion of the year, um, D.C. being the exception. So, Michael, Ali, hold Ali, on Ali. a second. One question, yes. because this was a question about data, too. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Is the data continuing to be maintained, and who, who, who's managing it? Because uh, that's a kind of interesting sure. aspect. If you're going to try something out and say we want to do it, maybe we want to do it for a longer term, um, somebody has to... Sure. Be uh, managing that. During the DNC, all data were manually entered each time a person checked out a bike and returned it. That's a tremendous amount of work. Um, however, modern uh, automated bike sharing systems generate a tremendous amount of data each time someone checks out a bike and checks it back in. Uh, so that's all automated. Uh, it's easily tracked, and many systems make at least some of their data available. Um, that said, that's just usage data. Uh, subscriber data are less well known. Uh, very few uh, pieces of information are gathered other than credit card information when someone registers. So other than um, investigations like I've done in the Denver bike sharing system to understand the demography of users, uh, 
that's not automatically connected, so uh, collected. So that's much less known in most other systems. Thank you. Um, Michael? Oh, I was just going to add on the weather uh, issue that um, I think what's weather tends to be less of a factor in bicycle use than than we think. I mean, Portland has uh, 35 degree and raining weather <laughs> pretty, um, you know, months on end, and, and uh, it doesn't seem to affect ridership very much, actually. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, the, the daylight saving time is a good one. Yes. Can you tell us who you are? That's a great question, and that's for further research. <laughs> yes, that's the next project. That's good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't think that was first thought about um, initially because it, it was really a group of artists, right, and um, design folks who just wanted to improve their space. And then um, I think that because San Francisco as a city is fairly progressive, um, the planning department started the pavement to parks program, um, so really leading the way there. Um, as far as tourism, um, I'm not quite sure I have numbers or how you would quantify um, if there's a if there's a significant increase in that way, like what me measures would you use? But um, yeah, it's, it's very cool. I like it. The tourism question, I think, brings up the, what opportunities are there for programming, tactically, um, public space um, in, a, in some more directed way. Yeah. The, who knows the unintended consequences? If I could add on to that just a little bit. Um, speaking of unintended consequences, um, initially Denver bike sharing for a permanent system, uh, it was anticipated that the majority of the trips would be for commuting uh, for residents of the area. And as it turns out, it's almost the exact opposite. Um, there is a huge uh, number of rides um, done by people who one of the very few items that are, are collected by people when they, they use the system is their zip code of home address. So um, it's possible to track those who are from outside the area. And about half of them are from outside of Colorado. And from the other half, about half of those are from outside the, uh, the Denver metro area. So there are a large number of people who are using the bike sharing system who um, we did not anticipate using it. And it's changed the character of the city um, to some degree for tourists in that it's more accessible to get to a number of different places on the bikes uh, without having to rent a car or, or uh, uh, be adherent to bus or train schedules. Unanticipated. I wonder if there are any other examples of what you would call, what you might call tactical urbanism um, in other parts of the country um, that could be described from among the audience. Um, this is, uh, speaking of speed, um, I think this is a fairly new idea, a new terminology, and already a year ago in the city of Miami, the Downtown Development Authority um, authored um, such an endeavor in which they took the uh, Downtown Boulevard, Biscayne Boulevard, which has a large quantity of um, uh, parking lot down the center of it, actually, and took a whole block and, and greened it, grassed it with various types of furnishing and so on. And so it had a conventional engineering firm um, uh, permit it and manage the construction. And um, you know, the DDA is the 
Downtown Development Authority. It's a con very much of a conventional um, uh, business-oriented group. Um, and so how quickly this concept moved from uh, guerrilla tactics to um, Chamber of Commerce activity. Any, are there any others? Yes. For painting a crosswalk. <laughs> yes. Um, how about a question from a new person, and then we'll close it down in about two, two or three minutes. If you stand, it might be easier for us to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, yes. In San Francisco, do you now have a, um, a permit application for the parklet? Do you, is that yeah, it's an official like request for a proposal. So they, they released um, what in the park the parklet manual goes through all of that. So there's I think two call for parklets, um, and then you have to like submit all the architect's drawings and um, and yeah, there's a whole process. And I think they're in their third cycle now. Perhaps learning from food carts. Anyway, thank you all for being with us. Um, I think we still might have a few more minutes if you'd like to speak individually with the presenters. Um, thank you. <laughs>